So there is a tribe in Namibia that perceives the different shades of green with as much clarity as you perceive the difference between green and blue. The reason for this is because it is adaptive for them to enshrine this in their culture. If they did not enshrine this in their culture, they might end up dead. After all, the difference between one shade and another, however slight, might mean the difference between a plant being toxic and a plant being nutritious. This reveals that there is a certain range of mobility provided by your biological scaffolding to instigate how you're going to perceive with the instigation of language. So when you believe that you are a persistent self with a persistent identity, that somehow this makes sense to say that things have essences that remain through time and that time is a thing that is ticking forward, these things both have a biological component and a cultural component. The biological component is that your parietal lobe is modeling object permanence by the time that you are a toddler. The cultural component is that you happen to exist in a culture that emphasizes the self. When I say you, this is appropriated as having meaning in a certain region of mind space. However, it may not be appropriated as having meaning in other regions of mind space. In the same way that uh, my very English language itself will not be readily understood by a Mandarin speaker, but nonetheless is helplessly understood by an English speaker. So when we speak of time, we are speaking of something which is occurring within culturally constructed and biologically constructed bounds. So in other words, it is not occurring un in the physical reality undergirding you. In the same way that you do not feel the need to project understands English language as a property that applies to all of physical reality, you should not feel uh, the need to apply your, your feeling of time to all of physical reality. In fact, Physical reality is described better by special relativity. In special relativity, we have relative reference frames. So when you have a set of events that are simultaneous in one reference frame, they may not be simultaneous in another's. So one occurs in the future, the other occurs in the past. Yet in another reference frame, it's the inverse of that. So what that reveals is eternalism. We exist in an eternal block. You have uh, then causality propagating at the speed of massless particles in this relativistic block. So the speed of causality then is indicated by these light cones. You have a future light cone and a past light cone. Of course, even the direction is really only uh, ever meaningful insofar as there is more entropy. There is an entropy gradient in one direction as opposed to the other, uh, but there is there's no real uh, time that applies to anything anywhere because of the relativity of simultaneity. So the pieces that go into creating you are necessarily eternal. All of these events are the circles. Those are eternal events that are just there. If you read the special relativity literature, you might find that at the crux of these uh, light cones, you find something that sometimes is called an observer. However, this should not be confused with your actual being an obs a, a conscious observer. Because um, after all, you could also call that a focal point, which sometimes it is. Uh, what goes into creating you is already distributed, comes together from things that are in the future light cone and in the past light cone. The reason for that is because in order to, for instance, detect a visual scene, you obviously need edge detection and you need color detection and you need to somehow have that all come together, that all takes up space time. So things are already in the future light cone and past light cone in these relativistic frames. So that means that whatever you are experiencing, well, it means two things. It means that what you are already experiencing can't be otherwise in some sense. Uh, and it also means that you cannot ever introspect into what is causing the binding. So you can never know what is causing the binding because, after all, you are inside of it. To, to think that you could know what, um, what the binding mechanism creating you was, you would have to believe that uh, the Newtonian mechanics uh, time was actually underlying physical reality so that you could move through it and somehow 
find out all of your uh, pieces. However, because a binding is you, you can't. So then we have uh, over there amplitude distributions. An amplitude distribution is then, a, well, we apply the Born rule to the amplitude distribution. This gives us the probability density of any given thing. We believe in the probability density. We believe that there are things that are uh, far more probable than others, even though other things might may just as well exist. So there are regions of reality in which you randomly stab all the people around you. Nonetheless, you do not buy insurance for those betrayal branches. So you believe that the Born Rule actually describes something. This is your faith in rationality. It's a belief. There's no way to get to it. There's no way to get a, dis a precisely discrete observable that says this is what's going to happen. Instead, you just have probability amplitudes all the way down, and then the density somehow encodes further meaning only if you, only if you make it so, only if you want it to uh, encode further meaning. In other words, you want to be rational. But since all of the pieces that go into creating your belief in the first place are already there, it must, and we don't anticipate to find ourselves in betrayal branches or gambling away our money and ex and becoming easy trillionaires, that must mean that there is a tendency towards ever greater rationality. There is a tendency unto greater and greater uh, capacity to to something. We don't know what the binding is. Why why are we what's differentially selecting all the different binding events as opposed to any others? But we know that somehow it has something to do with that which is most rational. Even if, since it's uh, probability all the way down, you can't actually ever know. Uh, you can never be certain. You can never be certain of what's actually going to happen. That's what affords that certain range of motion. Uh, open individualism, then, is our safety net. It's when you understand that it is the same being, because the very sense of self was relative. It occurred and occurs in some regions in the same way that English occurs in some regions and not in others. It becomes undone and then you see that you are the same experience. Safety nets seem to be what we like. This is the ultimate safety net. It's the womb. It's the truth that is at the bottom of everything. Some people want to return there um, before their time, <laughs> I guess, uh, but we like in general safety nets. So Given that I'm more familiar with the human region of mind space, I think that the next safety net that we have to jump to, because we have to tell ourselves that we need these safety nets, it's not like they're obvious to us because we don't naturally engage in a status quo reversal. And the people who are capable of engaging in a status quo reversal then have to get other people to like listen. And you can't give them a slogan that says, hey, guys, come and listen to me. It's pretty difficult to get people to do things just by, just with slogans. So there has to be a way to maneuver the competitive spirit of mankind into particular directions, however difficult it may be, in order to create safety nets that we don't readily notice. So for me, the next safety net that I see is roughly what is outlined by strategies for engineered negligible senescence. So we want to create a future in which we are biologically 25 regardless of how much so-called time actually goes on. And the way to do this is by having clinics in which we periodically go to and have our rejuvenation therapies that include things such as breaking amyloid plaques in our brains and also just stem cell injections, as well as perhaps updating our lysosomes with brand new enzymes that can degrade all the products that they can currently not break down. This is the goal of healthy life extension. When we have healthy life extension, then we remove a certain evil from reality, which is the evil that results when you realize that you are going to be destroyed and you have a sense of you in the first place and that all of the people around you are also going to be destroyed. 
So it's very difficult to believe in goodness and to behave with an aim towards goodness when you are going to be destroyed. However, when we create this next safety net, you will no longer feel that. Hence, humanity can move on towards the next uh, sort of obelisk, uh, as in 2001 Space Odyssey. We're just knocking these down. And the reason that I think Healthy Life Extension really is the next one is because if we want to funnel the competitive spirit of mankind, we have to look at where it is, in fact, being funneled, as opposed to just uh, thinking that people are disembodied and uh, good. You instead look into the sexual economics literature, and you find the things that men are most assessed by are their money and health. And this is no accident. These are the hardest of fake signals. You could only get so far while having uh, not the right car or not having the right house. At the same time, health is revealed by your physical appearance, your symmetry, your smell, etc. So these are the hard to fake signals and therefore what men are assessed by. Hence, what should in the abstract take up most of their uh, competitive drive. You cannot make money and you cannot be healthy if you become uh, decrepit and old and die.